Hi there, my name's Andrew Walkley. Thank you very much for uh, logging on and watching this video today, where I'll be talking about using Google Translate and Google Search to help uh, with language learning. Thank you as well, just to say to APAC for inviting me to do this talk. Now, when I uh, mentioned the idea of doing uh, using Google uh, in class or around class, very often people raise concerns about using it. So typically they may talk about a basic fundamental problem with methodology that they don't believe in using translation. Often that's because they think it's uh, Google Translate itself is not very accurate and it will cause lots of problems. Another fear is often that the students become reliant on using the translation tool and they don't do things for themselves. I think that is potentially a legitimate uh, uh, worry. Uh, they might say that they don't use it properly when they use it, uh, when they do use it. Uh, and very commonly, especially when we're thinking about doing writing for homework or whatever, you often hear teachers saying, oh, they're just copying and pasting. They're not really using the language, not remembering it. It's basically cheating. And underlying this whole kind of all of these concerns, I often feel that there is a basic thing that a basic fear that perhaps Google Translate, other uh, artificial intelligence is basically going to replace us as teachers that we won't be needed anymore. Well, what I want to argue is uh, that's not the case because it's partly a misunderstanding of uh, how uh, we can use Google, but also perhaps making us reevaluate how we think about our own teaching and how we, what we as teachers can do to add value in the classroom. So, my other way of looking at it would be to say, well, firstly, if you're learning a low level uh, language. So, for example, a lot of what we're going to see here is based on my own experiences of learning uh, Russian as a beginner student, teaching Spanish as a, um, you know, a beginner teacher and other experiences of language learning and teaching. And what I can say is that really we can spend so much time trying to avoid translation, trying to explain the words, trying to use pictures or mime, and really the most direct method will often be translation. Now certainly as you get higher up the levels that's going to be less the case, but certainly up to, I don't know, intermediate, up intermediate, um, you know, translation is is helpful. And at the lowest levels, it's essential in giving the students the security of knowing what's happening in class and understanding the language that we're teaching. Now, obviously, there will be mistakes. And as I say, as you go up higher up the levels, you're more likely to get those mistakes. But actually, unless you're using large amounts of text where Google isn't so good at identifying, for example, um, perhaps idioms within a text or references like pronoun references within a larger text, it's actually on a, on a smaller scale, it's accurate enough. And there will be mistakes. There will be ways that we as teachers recognize that what the students have produced is not what we would actually say. But usually it's accurate enough for us to get their meaning and then correct it and provide them with the proper English that they should learn. And that's how we need to be seeing uh, the use of Google as an enabling instrument and the teacher's role in moderating uh, the language which is produced and then building upon it and reteaching it, uh, the, the, the correct stuff. 
and exploring the correct language uh, to uh, develop students' language. Now, as I say, uh, I think it's true that students can potentially be a bit too reliant on translation because it is essential at certain points that students make the effort to recall language, that they're not just reading it out, but they're trying to remember it and produce it. That's a kind of crucial part of learning. But what we'll see is that uh, the way I'm thinking about using Google, it's a small part, it's mainly focused on providing meaning, enabling students to get new meanings that they want to produce. And it supports then practice in the L2, the, the target language. Uh, it, that's the main focus of the language, of the, the classroom activities. And it's using those practice activities in the target language that we as teachers are then exploring and correcting and making use of in the, 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 the language classroom. It's true, students don't often use Google properly. I mean, one of the fundamental things that they do is just to take a single word and translate single word, single word, single word, and then put them together. What we can show them is they need to be working on the level of collocation or small chunks, which is actually um, how Google works best. In fact, the, the way the, the analytics work tends to favor these kind of collocational looks at language. Uh, and I'll show you some other things that the students could do to support, to check their ideas and see if they are what people say, etc. Certainly, again, it's not that it's not true that students don't just copy and paste and then and then send it to the students. But at the same time, if as genuine uh, students wanting to learn, wanting to say new things, wanting to communicate, how if you don't know the language to communicate something new, do you get that language? Fundamentally, you need a dictionary in the past, but now really Google Translate is the most uh, useful uh, method and the most efficient method. As I say, what we then work on with teachers is correcting the English that is produced from this process. But I'll also show later in the talk how we can encourage the students to highlight how they've used Google and maybe provide moments where they're, they're not relying on it. And all of these things really are developing student autonomy, which is one of the things as teachers, it's not Google's not replacing us. What we're doing is showing them how to use it in a more uh, efficient way. And once we've shown them that autonomy, students will still want to come to class, still want to engage with uh, a teacher, I think. If we consider our role as slightly different than just simply giving translations or giving words or, or um, um, you know, doing exercises and not giving answers, because what Google can't do is it can't listen to what the students have produced. It can't respond to what they've produced, not simply in terms of the grammar, but in terms of them as people. It can't give us a kind of normal reply. Uh, it can't take that reply and then teach something uh, extra about it, show how this chunk will change, how we could use it in other circumstance. Uh, it can't joke or encourage the students. It's not a motivational tool. Again, as teachers, we can be doing that. And obviously, as teachers, we'll still be planning a course or a lesson and perhaps taking some of the language which come out of the students' use of Google to plan a new lesson. 
where we can practice that language or recycle it and show students how it's used in other ways. So all of these things are how teachers add value with the support of what Google can give. So what I'm going to do is to look through some uh, activities and ways that I use Google uh, Translate mainly and also some some extent the Google search um, to to support my teaching and learning. Here are the uh, the ideas. As I say, they're all based on my own practice, either as a teacher or as a learner. Uh, I won't read them out. You can see them there. Let's move on and have a look at this first idea. So the first idea is called messaging. And this is based on a slightly different approach to teaching languages, uh, which is suggested by the writer George Woolard in a book called Messaging. It's an ebook, you can find it online. And basically, what he suggests is working with uh, dialogues and identifying chunks. And then from these uh, chunks and from these dialogues, we create new dialogues uh, which the students might act out or make use of in their real lives. So, how does this go? Well, you can take a uh, a, a text ideally it's something which may you know you can imagine being said this one is taken from uh, outcomes beginner which is a book i've written you might take it from other course books or you know just write your own dialogues yourselves about particular situations or um, um and you put it into google and obviously you can get a translation now, the point about this is that all we are doing is checking the meaning. We're giving support in terms of the meaning. The work we're doing is with the target language, which is here on the left. It's the, the English that we're working with. Obviously, if you've got multilingual classes, you can get them to put it into their own language. So we can have it in Spanish. Obviously, I could choose Catalan as well, um, or French or whatever it is that the local language uh, the person is using. So then, based on this kind of understanding, the students, what you ask the students to do is to look through the text and try to say, can they identify phrases which they could reuse maybe in their entirety. So, for example, students might identify sorry I'm late as something they could repeat and just learn as a chunk. Uh, and other ones which they could uh, re remember, but maybe change slightly to create a new meaning. So, for example, we could take this whole little dialogue. Let's just go with that one. Uh, sorry, I'm late. There was a problem in London. Don't worry. What we could do, obviously, is just change this to, um, you know, uh, the name. Obviously, the students could work with it on that level. Uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, you know, we're, we're working with that that basis so they can see how the, they it basically works as a chunk. Obviously, the more interesting one is what they would do is to encourage them to think about other places or situations that they might have problems where they would say, sorry, I'm late. And we might as teachers need to prompt them and give support here. So the student might decide that, for example, work is a possibility. OK, so they get the um, the translation. They see it basically works in the same way. But what we want to do is to encourage them to check their ideas. And the way they check it is to simply uh, do a reverse translation and see if there are any changes 
to the English. And what they would notice is here that it's at work changes. And then we might just ask them to change it back and see if it changes again. Basically, if it's changing twice, then they might need to start again and, and might need to seek your advice as a teacher. In this case, though, what they see is it, it, it works, it stays as at work. So from this basis, they see that at work, you have problems at work, but a problem in a place. Uh, again, you know, they might want to experiment again. Is it at work? What about at uh, uh, the bus? Um, again, what they will see is in and out of wash. So it's kind of like uh, um, they can see that it's the same in Spanish. So there's no uh, difference there. Again, just change it round. This time it goes to on the bus. So, and then back again, they can see there was a problem on the bus. So what they build up is, an, is a slight, is a, to see how this phrase can change. But what they have is uh, basically a little dialogue with it, which they can use in different situations. And so basically what you would do is you can bury the chunks, check them, and uh, see how they go. The students might go back and either just rewrite this short kind of aspect of the dialogue. So they might just work on this. Sorry, I'm like, there was a problem. Don't worry. Uh, and, um, you know, think about other ways it might continue or just leave it at that. They might just work through the whole listening and think about other ways that they could vary the listening in light ways so we're basically keeping the same so how was the flight good the weather was good i mean in a way this is quite a simple way of changing things but you get the idea what students then would do obviously if they're going to make use of this is they need to try and learn the phrase try and remember it maybe act it out with a partner compare with, read it out with a partner, then maybe act it out without using the script, that kind of thing. So that's messaging. The next idea is kind of uh, word lists, the first idea about word lists and pre-teach, particularly pre-teaching. Now, the idea here is that often in course books, uh, we have vocabulary exercises which are based around lexical sets uh, linked by a semantic theme. So for example, all types of transport, all types of food, all ways of walking, these kinds of things. Now the problem uh, some um, research has suggested with that is that it kind of can sometimes create some confusions and actually students uh, it's suggested will find it slightly easier to learn words outside of these tight semantic sets so one way we can break these up even if they are in the book is to look at a unit and maybe take out a couple of the phrases from the lexical set but maybe also take some um, collocations which are new to the students from a reading or a listening have a look through the, the unit or the lesson and just pick out various collocations that you can see. They could be single words, but as we will see later, uh, actually Google works better on the collocational way. And it's also helpful for um, students to be thinking in terms of collocation. It's, to my mind, a better approach to teaching. So what I have here are just, um, they're translations of phrases that I've taken from uh, the English, okay? So I've taken the list uh, as I had before, but I've, I've changed it to an English list. It's the English list on the left that we, um, uh, you want to have. So this is the target language. This is the language the students have on their sheet or in the book or whatever. And 
what you do is the students you then just play uh, the translation okay so here we go i'm going to play it now una un día nublado dos un caluroso día de verano tres un camino helado cuatro un poco de viento cinco ver el pronóstico seis subir una colina you get the idea so the student having the numbers helps just to for the students to orientate themselves to to see what the the meanings are you can play it again okay una un día nublado dos un caluroso día de verano tres un camino helado cuatro un poco de viento and what you will notice is the the the, the google plays the re repetition slightly more slowly and that's quite a useful thing to remember and this will something we'll come back to when we come to practice our pronunciation so basically they hear it twice the students are reading through the list checking the meanings and then what you might do is ask the students then to work in pairs can they remember the meaning of the phrases that we're going to learn okay and that's basically it. it's just giving a bit of support in terms of initial meaning potentially you could work the other way um you could give the uh, the list on the right so you could give them the meanings and uh, show them the list and see if they remember the um, the english but it's going to be quite hard okay what we need to do is then to practice the english the target language we need to work with practicing that language so how can we practice that language and drill it and get them to repeat it well one thing is to basically provide them prompts uh, for the students um, in uh, my own book uh, uh, outcomes beginner and elementary outcomes elementary we actually have little pictures which are prompts but you can draw your own uh, prompts yourself and basically what you would give them they don't need to be particularly clear at this point because they're just the prompt to practice the language. So what you'd go is, uh, number one, do you remember uh, it's a cloudy day? You could just check. Do you remember the meaning? Un dia nublado. Okay. So everybody, listen, a cloudy day. Get everybody to repeat it, a cloudy day. Then you move on to number two get them to repeat, you know, uh, a summer's day, a warm summer's day. Okay, everybody, a warm summer's day. What was number one, by the way? Uh, uh, a cloudy day. Uh, and number two, a warm summer's day. And then we might go to three. Uh, what's this? Yes, it's an icy road. Do you remember what it means? Check again. Okay, what was number two? Uh, yes, a warm summer's day. And then number three, an icy day, an icy road, sorry. And then backwards and forwards. And we just kind of build, uh, kind of, it's almost like doing an, an active um, work with um, uh, flashcards, okay? Uh, where we're going backwards and forwards, getting students to remember uh, the, the phrases based on these um, and using the pictures simply as as prompts or as reminders you don't have to have pictures they could be uh, you could in fact just use the translation or the or a, maybe if you wanted to a day uh, or day a summer's day and we could just elicit the you know the extra words cloudy day summer's day a warm summer's day icy um, road etc or use the the prompt uh, in this case of the the um, the, the translation uh, you could even have just the numbers basically you just kind of tried to get the students going to go number one is uh, was cloudy day do you remember the meaning you know dear no blah etc etc so you can see by basically having the initial presentation through Google Translate 
that just gives the support then but the most of the practice most of the repetition the the recall we're not using google we're not just reading out we're remembering what the phrase was is done in english or in the target language whatever target language you're teaching okay that's a kind of way that i thought about use it kind of breaking up these lexical sets i mean you could be using uh you could be doing the same principle as a as a kind of pre teaching using a uh, vocab exercise again you might just take the words from the box you do a quick google translate students discuss uh if what they remember the meaning then they do the gap fill and then as you're going through the gap fill you're asking questions you're drilling the, the english etc then you go on to practice it in english you can see how it's basically all the the the, the main practice is then uh in the target language Another way of thinking about lexical sets, in a way, it's uh, it's similar to what we've um, uh, talked about already, but it's getting the students themselves to create these collocations rather than uh, us as teachers producing them. So you'll often find a word list in in the back of a uh, book, a uh, course book um maybe the sometimes the um uh, an exam board has produced these word lists this particular word list i, I looked at just because i think it's of interest because it's the 100 most common nouns in english and uh, i just chose it because i think uh, it's interesting to note just how you know quite a lot of these words don't get taught at the lowest levels. So a word like system, probably if you look it up, it'll be in a B1, a B2 kind of words. Uh, government often doesn't get taught at the low level, it's seen as politics. But, you know, as low level students, you know, we may want to say the government is good the government is bad, you know, maybe we even want to say the government is corrupt. But how do the students access that language? Basically, what we were encouraging the students to do is to move from these single words to collocations and try to basically getting them to think about how they would use these words and making their own list adapting the list, personalizing it away in a way to them. So they're working from the single word to a collocation or phrase. So, for example, if we take the word uh, system, OK, and think about how that might be used as a collocation. OK, I'm learning Russian now. So I'm thinking about the way that I might want to use the word system. Uh, and I would go, um, you know, I might want to talk about the health system, especially in these days of uh, these days of COVID. So the first thing is sistema, uh, whatever it is, we'll come to the practicing of these words again. First check for us might be uh, doing this. Uh, and what we can see is it seems to, to stay the same. I mean, it's changed the English healthcare system, but as a, you know, for me personally, I understand that health system is, is working fine. The Russian stays the same. And actually what's appeared here is, is this little figure, which tells me actually that this is something which has been approved by contributors so that's a kind of support I, I i could probably learn this phrase and know that it's good okay um we'll come to a little practice in a moment um i might want to develop that and say um you know for example uh problems with uh, the healthcare system. 
okay and here uh, it's it's not got the uh the, the little people uh thing here let's just again we can double check if it kind of seems to be fairly stable so then what i might want to do is just copy this and uh i then go to google uh, I think this may work better with some languages than others. I, I suspect, I'm not sure how much Russian is Russians use Google. They might use their own system, uh, VK, I think. But anyway, what we can do is basically put it in the quotation marks. Uh, and this means that we, we're just searching this particular chunk. And what I see is there's 12,000 results. So that suggests to me that it's reasonably common. It may be worth learning. OK, if it's below a thousand or it's maybe 20 or something like that, then I know that it's it's not worth learning. And and that I need to look for a different collocation and that it maybe is something else or at least check with my teacher if I've uh, chosen something good. OK, so that's the first part of it. The second part, obviously, is trying to remember or say the phrase. So let's just go with the simple one to begin with to save my embarrassment. So what I might do is I then, uh, apart from kind of turning this maybe into a Quizlet card to, you know, to test myself and remember the, 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 the phrase, is I might want to practice saying it. So, again, what I can hear is use the listen button. Sistema Zdravoachranenia. Now, if you remember, it's Sistema Zdravoachranenia, something like this. If you remember, um we if we press it a second time it goes a bit slower Sistema zdravoachranenia zdravoachranenia so Sistema zdravoachranenia Sistema zdravoachranenia Sistema zdravoachranenia Sistema zdravoachranenia Sistema zdravoachranenia OK, so I can basically just drill myself using the Google. Uh, what I could do is also I could just test myself by using the this button. Let's have a go. Sistema Strava Krachrenje. OK, I've, I've succeeded. Close enough. Close enough. Uh, so this is a kind of way that students can practice their pronunciation and drill themselves uh, outside of class to a level which will be recognisable enough, one presumes. So just to summarise these two parts, firstly, collocating the word list. You start with the word, you add collocations, thinking about things you might say, and again, this is part of learner training. You might need to kind of encourage students, question when they come up with odd uh, combinations. In a way, when they do the Google Translate or they check with the Google search, if this is a very small search, this is kind of suggesting that their choices are a bit unusual. Can they think of a better one? Once they've got a good one, you can check it if you like, but we can we can suggest that these are kind of secure enough. The students, we might encourage them to write a Quizlet card, try and remember the phrase, uh, the collocation. In terms of pronunciation, uh, as we've said, what they can do is use Google again to support that. They can listen to the collocation, say it twice. Second time, they'll hear it slowly. They can practice it, notice the stress. They can listen again and say along to it. And then they can try and reproduce it and they'll get some kind of feedback because Google will produce the, uh, the, the translation. And obviously they know the words they're trying to say. 
So this idea actually also uh, came to me and I've made use of when it comes to using, when I've been doing reading outside of class. So, for example, I have uh, uh, a book here. It's in Russian. This is one I've been using. It's got some, it's supposedly for, I think it's for uh, A2, which is really above my level, to be perfectly honest. And there are some words there which I'm struggling with. I've uh, got one here, which I've circled. Okay. And basically what I do is, again, I use that Google feature to look up the word. So rather than typing it out and finding it, I just encourage it, I would encourage students to use this uh, feature. Let's have a look at how it works again. So again, I have a word here which I don't know. I'm going to just try and say it here. Golka. Now that's not the right word. It's it's rather uh, different. I realise I've I've misread it actually. Uh, so I've got uh, an L instead of an R uh, word. So let me try it again. Gorka. Now again, I can see here it's not the right word. It's a different word, and slide doesn't fit in the meaning either. Now. Before I get the students to, you know, I would type it. What I would tell the students to do is, okay, try and say it now with the word next to it. Okay, and uh, let's try that one now. Gorka zaplakala. As you can see, it's not really A1 <laughs> because the answer is wet bitterly. And what I can see now is this is the same as I got in the book. The point here is actually it's it's, it's not worth learning. I, I don't think, you know, as an A1 student, I'm never going to use wept bitterly. So I can basically it's helped me to do the reading and understand the text. But the added value for me as a, as a student is I have practiced a bit of pronunciation uh, and and reading aloud, if you like. So it's that kind of bottom up uh, reading skills. Uh, but will I learn this? Will I put this in a Quizlet card? No, I won't. What is interesting, though, is also just to re-emphasize actually about using Google properly and which actually is encouraging good uh, learning practices in a foreign language, which is Google works better, particularly this kind of oral thing, as in, within collocations or within um, short phrases. So the reason it goes with Gorka had a different sound is it can't recognize and maybe I can't produce the subtleties which would produce these two different sounds. But when it goes together, basically the algorithm recognizes these words. These are the most likely words together. It's, it's working on probability, basically. Idea, in other words, it's working on the basis of how collocation works. And so, you know, that's a real encouragement to students of good learning practice. So obviously, if it is a useful collocation, well, maybe in that case, we put it in a Quizlet card or we write it in our notebook and we try and remember it. Or, you know, we might share it with uh, the teacher somehow in class. We might have a, a task in class where we ask students to share the language that they have learned from their reading. And you, as you're going around the class, can notice the phrases they've come up with you can comment about whether those are useful phrases, share the useful phrases with other students, perhaps ask questions about them, turn them later into another lesson into some kind of material or discussion, and therefore make use of um, uh, that language. Which brings us to this last 
uh, area, which is uh, writing and homework and the, the concern about uh, students cheating. Now, as I mentioned, I think this is a genuine concern. We know that students often just copy and paste whole texts. Um, we also see students who kind of lose faith in themselves almost and have to look up everything on Google. Uh, and so what we have to do is to encourage moments where they are recalling and using the language that they know. So the first thing which I haven't actually got on this slide is to remember that perhaps we have tasks within the classroom or homework that we set where we say, don't use Google. Okay, just do it on the basis of what you know, and we could do it as a timed writing or a timed speaking or whatever. Another way that we can kind of encourage this is to ask students to basically do it from as far as they remember, but to highlight a section, either to leave the section in, in their own language, that could be another possible route, or to highlight the section that they have translated using Google. They may cheat on this kind of thing, it's possible, but in the end we can't control that. And I think the thing we need to focus on is whatever they've produced, we can make use of that language. So, you know, if they have cheated and used Google, what we'll be seeing now is how we can test that and turn it more into active learning. So obviously the first thing we might do is to correct any errors in the text. We could give these as kind of phrases uh, for students to correct. We could do it together. We could point out these errors. You could write them on the board, ask for corrections, or write the sentences it should be with gaps and elicit keywords either of grammar or vocabulary. Ask questions about that and check meaning, etc. We could also um, get them to look at the text and then put the text away, ask them to retell whatever it is they've written without looking at the text. We can give them five minutes. If they do very badly, we can question them. What happened there? The cheat, it reveals perhaps where they're cheating, but they still are producing something. We could ask them to have a look back, see what they can remember translate it again if they've forgotten the meanings of some words, see if they can put those into use by retelling it again. We could do this as a two or three um, uh, attempts, basically, maybe with different partners, okay? Another thing is you might take some of the students' texts. Now, obviously this is easier in a one-to-one -one or small group situation, uh, where you can just basically use all the texts of the class, so it's the, just the class, the, the individual student or the individual two students. But if you've got a larger class, then you just have to share it around. Maybe you start by using one of those texts which you think have been more copied and pasted, and you can uh, turn that into a gap fill text. And basically what you would do is you give that text back to the students, they would do it, fill in the gaps. Again, you might give them some support for the gaps if you want, or just leave them blank uh, and do it as a kind of closed test. You go through the answers. As you're going through the answers, you do some kind of messaging yourself as a teacher with the students, maybe highlighting chunks, showing them how it could be changed um asking questions about the vocabulary which generate other language once we have highlighted these new chunks and grammar that have come out uh, of their googling um we can ask them to to turn them into things that they try to remember again quizlet cards or rewriting sentences 
Another possibility is to basically give them back, every, give everybody back the text or give different people back text and ask them to highlight the chunks and grammar, basically that messaging activity that we saw er earlier and get them to do it themselves so that they are turning their own research of Google into something a little bit more productive. And then obviously, as a final part, whatever we've done with those texts and the other process, we get the students to create new true examples. Maybe we ask them to turn it into a little conversation. Um, we work on that text and create a new act, uh, speaking activity out of it. And in that way, even if cheating is going on, we're checking on it, we're showing the, the limits of that, but we're also turning it into a positive, we're turning it into useful um, teaching material. Obviously, uh, you might need a bit of time to develop that, so you might, you know, come back like a week later or two weeks later where you have made use, you know, had time to make use of those uh, the text and turn them into classroom material. So what I hope I've shown is Google is certainly our friend, that as teachers we can add value in many ways above and beyond what Google can do, and that it's really providing a, a support for students and enabling communication rather than uh, being uh, something that should be seen as dangerous or a threat to learning and teaching. Hope you enjoyed the talk uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the talks uh, in the APAC convention. Um, if you're interested in what we're doing, you can check out our website at lexicallab.com. We do run uh, online teacher training uh, courses. You can do them as self-study version, where some of these ideas feature and lots more, particularly this idea of focusing on adding value uh, through uh, questioning and communication uh, beyond uh, the course book. Hope you've enjoyed it. Good luck. See you soon. Mm -hmm.